So um, this uh, seminar uh, will talk about my work over the last several years, starting in 2004, to address the deficiencies that I found when trying to elicit requirements from stakeholders and running into problems with the existing modeling tools in that they basically could not model what I was trying to capture. Um, so um, starting in 2004, uh, I started to work on uh, a replacement for UML, which does not completely replace UML in the design space, only in the elicitation space. It also can sit on top of SysML. And the idea was to come up with something that was easy to use, uh, was relevant to stakeholders uh, who are not computer savvy, and could capture all the things I needed to capture while I had the stakeholder in front of me. And um, so what I'm going to do is walk you through the different issues and what we did about them. And this work was done in collaboration with the Technical University of Munich and, and the uh, student who worked with me to develop this package is just finishing his doctorate and he's using this topic for his thesis. So uh, what I found when I sat with stakeholders and I attempted to model their processes and capture their issues and problems was that there were missing facilities that I needed. For example, if a stakeholder had an idea, uh, there was no way in the UML or SysML to capture an idea. Also, we have a uh, language called, a modeling language called I-Star Go Modeling. And what that does is it's a little bit like uh, a combination of pew matrices and house of quality in that what you can do is you can put goals down and you can weight them and then identify the, co the conflicts between those goals and try to resolve them. And I would sit with management, and it was very hard to do this. Um, sure, I could have used iStar, uh, but the problem is I would then have the problem of working in a different, uh, in a different media, and, and I'd have traceability problems when I go to build product or to execute projects. So I wanted something where I could capture these ideas and goals and then a des uh, designer or manufacturing could see them uh, connected right to their right to the uh, component when they tried to do the manufacturing. Oh, in addition, I had problems in that a lot of the projects I worked on were situations where people wanted to reverse engineer a product line out of a single product. So, for example, in California, Siemens manufactures light rail vehicles, and they. They have several variants because of the uh, radius of the track and how heavy the vehicle can be and how many passengers it has to carry. And it was nearly impossible using the UML or SysML off the shelf to capture the variation points in such a way that the stakeholders could understand them and then I could later on go ahead and hand them off to manufacturing or to the designers. Uh, another issue that I ran into was that of uh, hazard and threat modeling, identification and mitigation. What we do now mostly is we uh, we build this, we build, take all the requirements, so we put all the requirements in a system, and then after we have all the requirements in the system, or we have all the product features, we then go in and analyze them for potential hazards and threats. The only problem with that is by that time the stakeholder is gone. And what you want to do is when you're talking to a stakeholder, it would be really nice to say to the stakeholder what are the potential hazards and what are the potential threats uh, involved with this particular feature that you just mentioned. And I'm going to show you examples of that where they're quite impressive. Some of the um, hazards and threats can be uh, quite daunting. Okay, finally, uh, I have been in a lot of situations where I had to do presentations to corporate management, and first of all, they're not used to UML or SysML, and it's quite difficult to understand. But then there's also the issue of the distinction between use cases and business processes. So a business process is the customer's process 
how they do their work so that you can uh, elicit the requirements for new products or services. A use case basically is the interaction between the services you're planning to build or the product you're planning to build and the outside environment, and they're quite different. Um, and unfortunately, within the UML and SysML, they use the same symbols. So uh, they both use activity diagrams, and they both use uh, the uh, use case symbol. So, And also the interfaces, I've had a lot of trouble modeling interfaces because I'm dealing with people like, Mac, uh, like packaging engineers and uh, uh, IT people, and when you say, for example, to a packaging engineer that when I, I had this problem when I was working on, uh, on a mail sorting system for the U.S. Postal Service, um, I was using sequence diagrams, and uh, I attempted to send a message to a loading dock, and the room exploded because uh, everyone felt that there's no way that you could send a message to a piece of concrete. So these issues resulted in uh, design of a new language, um, that, sits, uh, that does not replace SysML or UML, so don't get excited. It only complements it. Um, I, it is, was not my intention to reinvent the wheel. It was just my intention to provide the facilities that I needed to do my job. So the other issue that I found was that I would have uh, conversations with people at the very beginning of a project, and then we would carry all the way through to manufacturing, and I would, people would say, well, let me see the trace matrices. And I would want to see whether the goals were resolved in the final product. And because things were being captured in different tools, it was nearly impossible to do that. And you had to develop these relatively complex heavyweight tool chains. So uh, to avoid doing that, I wanted to throw everything but the kitchen sink into a single modeling environment where you could easily connect things. I could connect a goal to a product feature. I could connect a hazard to a product feature. And then I could connect that product feature to a design. And then I could connect the design downstream and start using traditional SysML. So that was my basic objective. Now, to do this, just to give you a little background, um, we tried to make the symbols that we used ISO compliant. Um, we have the concept of semiotic clarity. And semiotic clarity, this is uh, a heuristic associated with visual languages. This says there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence between semantic constructs and graphical symbols. And sure, everyone can overload uh, SysML and roll their own, but I wanted something that was ISO compliant and that could be used and recognized by everybody. So you, if you look at this, uh, figure, if you look at this slide, you will see that requirements, properties, classes, constraints, signals, and test cases all use rectangles. And uh, you could understand, easily understand that perhaps that's where some of these jokes about engineers come from, that is uh, everybody's uh, rectangular or, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. There's a lot worse than that. But you notice that everything's a rectangle. And that's because uh, the people who developed the languages in the past did not look at issues of understandability, semiotic clarity, heuristics of visual languages. All they looked at was solving an engineering problem and everything was a box. So um, what I did is I, I had uh, um, I, I created surveys. We showed groups of people symbols. We asked them which which was closest to a concept. Um, the the one area where I ran into trouble was when we were dealing with actors, and um, we had a bunch of people who wanted to have a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger as the actor. So that. <clears throat> That did cause some consternation, but we did wind up coming up with something else. So um, we developed this new language that is in collaboration, Siemens and Tum, and it's called, or I called it, the Unified Requirements Modeling Language, and you'll find references to it all the way back to 2004 when I first presented the idea and looked for uh, collaborators. So it has a, an abstract syntax. It, it has a concrete syntax. There's a full meta model behind it explaining the relationship for the first time, I think, between a requirement, 
a product feature, a goal, and so on. So this is something relatively new. In the past, people went into their own environments and created their own relationship sets. So we have a formal set of relationships between all of these different concepts that are used in uh, requirements engineering, hazard analysis, and so forth. So the, the four areas that I'm going to show you are system and process modeling, product line engineering, goal modeling, and um, danger modeling. Now, I use the word danger because we found that hazards and threats were two sides of the same thing and that we could use the same set of facilities and, and basically the the hazard and the threat uh, mirrored each other, and in both cases you would need a mitigation, um, which could be either a procedure or it could be a, a new requirement that would involve some piece of physical equipment or some software. Okay, so the unified requirements modeling language for the first time, I think, permits a unified holistic view of systems for eliciting requirements, hazards, threats, and variations and you don't have to wait till you've captured all your requirements to start eliciting the hazards. If someone pops up with an idea, you can drop it right on the diagram. If someone start, wants to talk about threats or variation points, which happens to me quite frequently, you can drop it right on the diagrams while, you're, while you've got the stakeholder in front of you and you're eliciting information from the stakeholder. So the first implementation was done in... Um, Enterprise Architect, um, we picked Enterprise Architect because it was so commonly used within the Siemens company, and right now I'm looking for someone to pay me to move it over to other tools like Artisan, like Magic Draw. So the language is tool agnostic. Keep that in mind, and this is just the, the first implementation, and it's only version one, and we're still missing some semantics that I'm hoping to get some funding to implement uh, later on. But, but anybody who wants this can have it. There's no charge. The only uh, restriction is that it only works with, enterpri with uh, Enterprise Architect version 9 or later. So we have system and process modeling. We have goal modeling. We have product line engineering. And for those of you not familiar with product line engineering, one of the uh, types of modeling you do is called feature modeling. So there's two aspects to product line engineering, and I'll show you that later. One is the creation of a feature tree um, for all possible variations uh, throughout your product line, and then you can strain that with a product map, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. And then finally, hazard analysis and threat modeling, which we combine and call danger modeling, although we do use different symbols for hazards and threats. And here's an example of uh, a very simple example where you have a car and there's a possibility that the child will put their foot on the, car, on the car door and the window will come up and they'll have their head stuck out and all kinds of bad things will happen. Now the interesting thing is I presented this case in 2004 and people were saying, well, that's ridiculous. And then about a month later, uh, a child got killed in a Ford car, um, exactly that, that technique. So anyway, um, we have, um, we have uh, uh, symbols for, for a, a stakeholder. We have symbols for process. We have symbols for hazard. And you'll note that these symbols actually use the uh, international representation and I'll show you what all of them are. So you can easily distinguish between a mechanical problem, a biohazard, a chemical problem, and electrical problem, and so on. And here you see a um, an external actor. But for this particular external actor, we can see that it's a machine rather than a person. Here's a person over here. Um, there's a child. And you can see that um, the child is represented by uh, not a stick figure, but by a real image of a person. And then here we have the mechanical or external actor, which is not a human, represented by a little robot. Um, someone told me an interesting story about this. Uh, they were in the military, and they were presenting uh, a use case model at which several general officers were sitting in, 
And the general officer started screaming that there was no way that you could represent their officers with a stick figure and that they demanded that something else be used. So you can get some some weird reactions occasionally. Okay. So anyway, I'm going to moving right along here. Uh. So for system and process modeling, we distinguish between a business process and a use case. So we can see that a business process, you see the two business people with a little suitcase shaking hands. And this is something I, if I have time, I'll show you an actual um, process model for a medical, for a medical system. And it'll give you, show you the power of this language. Uh, down below we have a use case, and of course for a use case you have objects that are used, objects that are created, interfaces, and here for a, for a mechanical interface you see that we have, actually I think this is a UI, but we actually have a little finger on a push button, and um, so you notice how nice it is that I can distinguish between um, a mechanical actor or a programmatic actor and a human actor. And um, so, and then you see that you, instead of having two people shaking hands, you have the CRT screen, and that represents a use case as opposed to a business process. It's not very fancy, but it, it does the job. And here we have an object, and an object can be a composite object or a single object. And a composite object we represent with a file cabinet, and a single object we represent with a different symbol, which I'll show you. So we use different symbols for different concepts, which makes stakeholder reception very a very positive uh, thing. And I've used this now on several projects and with very positive response by stakeholders who are not computer people. Okay, so now let's just talk briefly about product line engineering. And those of you who are not familiar with product line engineering, the most important thing to remember is that we want to capture potential variations from product to product to product in a product line. So here we have, this is called a feature tree, or this is part of a feature tree, and um, we have a composite feature here. Um, this is the Malibu Chevrolet Malibu drivetrain, and you see, and then you have um, uh, different symbols. This, for example, the solid dot means that it's mandatory. A hollow dot over here, for example, a, a exhaust tip would mean that it's um, optional. And here you see this um, uh, this hollow arc represents an exclusive or. So you have two p possibilities, an exclusive or and an exclusive or. And then you can annotate with things like if you use a chrome exhaust tip, it requires that you have the Ecotec six-cylinder engine. And you can put this right into your model. Uh, here's a six-speed automatic transmission. So these are what are called features, product features. And this is right in Enterprise Architect, and you can stick it right on top of your, uh, your design model, and then you can connect the features right to your design, right to the blocks or internal blocks in your design. So here's a product map. And here, for example, by the way, I pulled this off the web, so this is real. Um, as of last year, anyway, I don't know if it's true this year. I did it on a tr on a plane coming back from Europe. Here's a Chevrolet Malibu, and this is the start of the feature tree for the Malibu. And here's the LS, the LT, 2LT, 3LT, and I don't don't ask me why they named it that way, but here you can see here's a, a product line. You can see the multiple blocks, and here are the individual products in the product line. And then what happens is once you do that, you can then create what's called a product map. And what the product map allows you to do is assign features, the edges of, uh, of your tree, to assign features to, the, uh, to different models. So here's the 1LT, 2LT, 3LT. And, for example, if you look at color-colored molding, you'll see that the 1LT, 2LT, and 3LT have them, but not the LS or the LTZ. And you can also do the same thing with, with feature groups, and that's, for example, if you ever try to do a build your own on the web, uh, that's how they do it. They make feature trees, and then they constrain the feature trees, and they walk the feature trees as you're trying to build your car. 
So that's basically how um, how that's typically done online. But anyway, now you have the ability to do this. The, I did not create this, by the way, this map. This map is just off-the-shelf uh, enterprise architect. It's just uh, a matrix where you can create relationships and then show what connects to what. Okay, so for hazard and threat modeling, we want to be able to capture threats and their mitigations. And here you see, for example, the mitigation is uh, a little ambulance. And we, we have the threat. You see this mask. And I can have several different kinds of threats. This is a financial threat. I can have uh, identity theft. And I can have um, financial, financial theft. Um, and here I have a property asset, and so I can have theft of property. And so this particular case, we're using a, we're mitigating the property theft with a security fence. We're uh, mitigating financial theft with, uh, without the transfer of funds, without biometric identification. And this is just an ordinary requirement, by the way, but we mark it because it's a mitigating requirement. And then if someone in doing design or manufacturing wants to know that the requirement's there, it's fairly obvious where it came from. Here's identity theft, and we're encrypting customer identification to present threat modeling. Here's an example of hazard analysis. Um, and this is real, by the way. Uh, you can see medical processes can get a little hairy. Um, I also have some requirements on here, you can tell the two types of requirements because gears are uh, functional requirements, and then we use a diamond symbol to represent non-functional, and then for the adornments, we pulled it right off the ISO standard. Um, so here you see uh, all different kinds of um, potential hazards, and the nice thing about this is that I captured them with the stakeholder while I was sitting there, and the stakeholder was a medical expert describing this process to me. Okay, so we use unique symbols for the common hazard types, and of course you can always extend them for your own. So this is a uh, social, uh, social hazard, uh, for example, a riot on a train platform, uh, electrical hazard, mechanical hazard, uh, nuclear, uh, chemical hazard, I think this is biological, and this one I can't, oh, this is uh, environmental hazard, and this one I can't read. You'll see it later on when we go to blow it up. Uh, so we mix hazard threads and requirements, and we can do that. And we use special symbols for mitigations here. So you can identify the mitigations, and you can carry those through. Um, and you can all, uh, this is useful for early identification of, of potential issues. So for goal modeling, we have things like a goal, a soft goal. A soft goal is something that's not testable, like high quality. A regular goal is something that's actually testable. Um, for example, I want my company, um, I want to increase my revenue for, by 2% this fiscal year. And then we have different kinds of stakeholders. That's another thing. We Here we distinguish between the customer and a business stakeholder, such as a corporate officer in my company. And we can t attach an assessment sketch. What an assessment sketch is, I'm talking to a customer, and the customer says, well, I want high quality. And I say to him, okay, from your perspective, um, how would I test my product to assure that I achieved your objective? And you can write in little uh, assessment sketches or little ways that potentially for ideas for the testing people, that they may then flesh out into full-blown uh, test plans and test procedures. So it's just uh, capturing ideas for testing. It's not intended to replace test plans and test ideas. And here's an example of a, um, of a goal model. By the way, this is a real goal model, but it's been sanitized for this particular environment. Let me just check at this point and see if there's any questions. No questions at this time. We'll continue on. Okay, so... You see that here um, I have positive and negative. So positive means reinforces, and negative means, of course, uh, negatively impacts. So I want a high-quality product, 
but um, my cost in lieu, including labor should be less than a certain amount of euro. And of course, every time you increase the quality, you decrease the uh, you increase the cost. So there's a negative impact here. And you can you can um, layer these hierarchically. The little glasses mean that this explodes into a set of goals. And you can replace the plus and minus with uh, numerical values, and then you can perform goal optimization to determine uh, what the priorities of your goal should be. And we also, of course, can identify conflicts right up front with the stakeholders and the customers uh, rather than come back to them a month or two later and say, you know, we have a problem here. Okay, so to summarize, uh, the URML is a work in progress. Um, it's still missing construction heuristics, which we intend to add if I ever get the funding to do it. And an as yet unexplored area is the relationship of the URML con uh, uh, requirements concepts to SysML design concepts. Right now, it's connect anything to anything, which is true of generic SysML. It has been tested on uh, several internals projects and a medical case study, but basically it works. I mean, there's a few issues we determine, things we'd like to change, things we'd like to improve, but basically it works. And um, this is my uh, blue sky list. I'm not getting very far um, because of the fact that uh, my funding was pulled because of hard times at Siemens, so I won't go there any further. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you some case studies. Um, two of them are, actually all three of them are real. The automotive product line is the one I briefly showed you before. It's the Chevrolet Malibu product line. Um, the hospital medical process is a real medical process, and we wanted to take something that we could publish as opposed to the Siemens ones, which are all, all have um, IP in them, and I couldn't couldn't publish them. I we tried to take a generic hospital process, take it end to end, so that we could actually show um, the URML used in a real case study. And then I'll show you some of the implications for medical equipment. Uh, this is for a CR medical scanner, and I, I of course I had to sanitize it because Siemens really makes this thing. Okay, so I'll come, we'll come back to questions afterwards. However, let me just remind you at this point, I'm checking for questions. I haven't seen any so far, and I'm going to um, I'm going to, to go on now, and um, I'm going to share my desktop because I want to show you uh, some of these uh, samples. Okay, I'm hoping. Um, Okay, I want to show you the Chevy product, uh, Chevrolet product line. Um, can everybody see this? Rihanna, can you see this on the screen? Uh, yes, I can. Um, yeah, I can see. Um, it, it's, it's zoomed in, but I, I can see what, what we need to see, I think. I'll let you know okay. if not. You should see a product line of General Motors cars consist of Buick, GMC, Chevrolet, and Cadillac. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk down the product line, and now we're just looking at the Chevrolet product line. And I'm going to walk down further, and I don't know how long it takes for your screens to paint, so I'll, I'll give it like a one or two second delay before I move on. Here we're um, in the Malibu, Chevrolet Malibu product line. And here we have um, the Chevrolet Malibu feature tree. And so what I can do now is I'm going to say, okay, here are all the cars in my product line. And what I want to do now is I want to do the full scope of all possible features in my Chevrolet Malibu current and future. And then I'll constrain which product has which features through the use of a product map. And here we have the Malibu feature tree. And you see anybody who buys a car. I picked this so that everybody would be familiar with it. And here, for example, we have the Malibu exterior. I don't have time to walk down everything, so 
I'll just go down this this one, and we'll go down the exterior. And here we're going down the exterior, and you see that I have Malibu door handles, and I have a choice. Um, I have a body colored door handle, and I have a chrome door handle. Um, a standalone option that you can get is fog lamps. Then in terms of the glass that I'm going to get, I have to get glass, and I have a choice of either acoustic laminated glass or solar ray tinted glass. And if I slide over to the grill here, you see that I can have a, um, a black grill um, with chrome inserts, and then I can have a silver insert, chrome surround, and we're sliding over further. And here we have the Malibu mirrors and Malibu molding, and you see that we need to drop down further to see these. So I'll go down to the molding, and we see that for the molding we have three choices. We have LS moldings, we have LT moldings, and then we have molding rocker, body colored with bright inserts. And then you see that the LS and the LT potentially can share um, body side, body colored moldings, and the uh, rocker. Now, this solid arc, by the way, represents an inclusive ore. Um, and we've been having, we had some trouble, obviously we couldn't, do everything we wanted in Enterprise Architect. Some of the graphics, uh, we ran into problems with some of the graphics. So let me close that down. And then what I do is I go over, I use one of the standard features of, um, of Enterprise Architect, and I go to a relationship matrix. And you see here, what I can do now is I can walk down this uh, matrix and if I can figure out how to get down there, um, and I can specify, oh, for example, um, I don't know why, for some reason right now I can't scroll down. I guess we we found a bug in uh, we found a bug in Enterprise Architect anyway. So I can go over, for example, and say that the uh, driver has uh, front airbags. I can let me move this out. Uh, Side airbags, and I can specify I can specify a composition there, so I can specify and and um, you can specify optional mandatory um, whatever you want here, and then you can basically create your product map that way so that's that's the sh that's using and I'm using standard enterprise architect here. And so, for example, I can go down and I can say SysML 1.3, and I have all the facilities of off-the-shelf SysML. And so, for example, I can go, let me just do this. Um, let me go back here. Just to show you that this thing really works. I'm going to copy the copy. Oh. Uh, so then I can go down here, for example, and I can go to a SysML 1.3, and I can go to a block diagram, And I can go here and I can say new diagram uh, project, uh, new diagram. Uh, and I'm going to say block definition. And I can uh, drag a block down. Oh, I see what I did. And you, so you can see, I can mix and match, and I can say this block, uh, uh, this block is related to uh, acoustic laminated glass. So you see that I have not abandoned SysML or UML, and in fact, it, this enhances them. 
and I'll show you one or two other examples shortly. So let me close this down. And let me bring up, let me just check for questions. No questions yet, okay. And let me bring up a, uh, a, uh, a simplified model of a medical system. This particular medical system is a CR medical scanner that was developed for um, developed for uh, Siemens uh, by Siemens rather. And I'm only going to show you a very very small piece of it. Um, and you see here that my design, and you see that the design um, is completely associated with the. Uh, and completely integrated with the rest of the model. And you can see that here. And here you see we have a use case moving the stand and table. Because the CR medical scanner, you have a joystick and the, the operator can move the stand and the table. And you see that this particular set of uh, feature of components realizes um, this particular use case. So you can see that it uh, it mixes and match, and I'll show you something else about it uh, in a few minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk down through the medical system, and uh, you see this little sign here. That's a roadblock, and that says under construction, just, you'd look, just like you'd find on a road where the road was blocked because there was construction going on. So we thought we'd use something that everyone would recognize. So it says, don't go here right now. Uh, the road is blocked, and but I can go to a patient encounter, and I'll drop down to a patient encounter, and then you have all these issues associated with a patient encounter, and I'll drop down to executing an examination, and now you see all of the external actors associated with executing an examination, and I have to be able to acquire the images and then manage the images, and I'll go to acquiring the images, and you can see now that one of the things I have to do is I have to be able to move the stand and the table. And here you see I have a non-functional requirement. And my non-functional requirement is the stand shall move slowly and continuously to avoid discomfort to the patient. And uh, that use symbol is usability. That's right out of ISO, so I'm not inventing anything. And if I open this up, let me open this up. You see here you can specify functionality, usability, maintainability, reliability, efficiency, and portability. And, of course, you can do searches and sorts and do all kinds of complex processing on this once you have it. Um, I also want to show you, I think you might get a kick out of this, um, somewhere in here. Uh, no, I don't have it here. Okay, I'll have to show it to you later. Um, I can also specify that a requirement is regulatory in nature. And now I can show his moving the stand and the table. And, of course, now I have an activity diagram which says I have two particular cases. I have one where I uh, move it normally and one where I strike the table. And here's where I strike the table. And now you see that I can slide down and I can use, um, here's looping while in the collision zone. This is probably familiar to all of you. This is a, a standard uh, sequence diagram in SysML. So you can see that the URML and SysML plug and play together quite nicely. I also have somewhere in here, if I can find it, uh, okay, so here we have the state machine for the movement of the table. And you can see that we have the, uh, this is a relatively high level view of the states uh, involved in uh, moving 
uh, moving the table, the table that the patient is resting on, or moving the C-arm that's going to do the um, X-ray. Okay. So that's the end of that. And uh, the one last model I want to show you, I think you'll enjoy looking at, is a real medical process. And um, I'm going to show you that I'm going to close this one down, and I'm going to bring up the Chemlia process. This is the model of a phlebotomy process in a hospital. And you know that medical processes tend to be very, very difficult to model um, because they're so complex and there's so many human factors involved. And um, I thought perhaps that you might enjoy seeing this. So we have three phases. We have pre-analytical, we have analytical, and then we have post-analytical. And um, this was done in conjunction with medical experts, by the way. So if we look at the analytical phase, uh, although I could just as easily look at the any of the others, let me... you see that uh, sample processing is subject to just a few possible hazards, like instrument malfunction in, in delivery of reagents and sample carryover, reagent carryover, cross-contamination, reagent cross-contamination, reagent calibration, and reagent stability. Now, normally, if I was a machine manufacturer of uh, analysis equipment, I would take the requirements, and at the end of the requirement definition phase, I would then define the hazards. What this has allowed me to do is to, do, is to capture some of the more critical hazards with the stakeholder who knows the most about hazards prior to getting someone who's a hazard expert to go and do that. And now here you see I have um, instrument function checks and laboratory quality checks. Now, that's something else. What, what the um, standard off-the-shelf system out gives you is a requirement. But um, here we have a mitigating requirement. This is a functional requirement. But what we have here are procedures. And so I can distinguish between a procedure that mitigates a potential hazard and a, 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 a mandatory requirement that mitigates a potential hazard. So if I go down and drop down here, you see that I have three types of procedures I need to follow, quality control testing, proficiency testing, and result validation. And over here you see that I have instrument function checks, and you see all the different kinds of, uh, of functional requirements that I need now in order to mitigate the possibility of having all of that um, possible uh, contamination of a this is for a, a blood sample, so you could understand why you need to be very careful here. Okay, so if I look at the post-analytical phase, again, we have um, sample archival, and again, we have all of these issues. And here you see I'm putting a goal on the screen, and this is a stakeholder goal, and this is the, and this is the um, goals associated with the stakeholder. And here we have a... Uh, here we have a non-functional usability requirement and for sample archival, and here we have all of the uh, both functional and non-functional requirements. What I wanted to show you here, if I right-click, I have the ability to specify that a requirement is regulatory in nature, so now when you look at it, you can see, everybody see the little uh, policeman or, or customs inspector over there, and that identifies this particular requirement as a regulatory requirement. Um, and I can, again, I can take this all the way. Let me just show you how easy it is to drop a requirement uh, over here. So, whoops. So here's my URML, and I have a um, I have a hazard. I'll drop the hazard, and they get a pop-up saying, "What kind of hazard is this?" I can always specify uncategorized if it's something rather unusual. 
But I think we've pretty much covered the spectrum here. So here's a biological hazard, and I'll click on biological. And you see here we now have the standard symbol for a biological hazard. And um, I can do this all while I'm engaged with the customer very early in the life cycle. And, of course, later on, let me copy that. And now, now you can see I can specify um, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of relationship I want to use, and you could you could override this with something like uh, um, regulatory or whatever you want whatever you want to. Uh, I'll just call it usage. Okay. And so, so you can see now that once you've done the uh, requirements, you can. Um, using the URML, you can go and take your uh, design and you can attach, you can take those hazards that you identified, you can move them down, you can take the requirements, move them down, and so the URML plugs and plays with both SysML and UML. Um, so at that point, this point in time, what I would like to do is um, I would like to open uh, it up to questions if anyone has a question, right now I'm looking and I don't see any questions at all. So if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to do so. Rian, should they uh, use the um, uh, should they use the uh, mechanism in uh, the meeting mechanism, or should they just unmute and they ask? Hi, Brian. Yeah, um, we don't have too many people on the line, so if, if anyone wanted to ask a question uh, vocally, they can unmute themselves by um, doing star six. And I think as long as we talk quite slowly, then that should be manageable um, if, the, if the question and answer box isn't, isn't working. Sure. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions for Brian. If you star six, you can unmute yourself. I, I have a question, Brian, if, um, if nobody else does yet. Um, do you, so would you present this um, to customers as it, as it looks, um, as you were saying, you um, it it's clearer than um, UML or SysML. And have you found in your experience that it's been you've been able to present um, you've been able to present this to to customers directly, and, and how have they taken it? If you have, well, they loved it, um, especially things like these little symbols for hazards and mitigations. Um, I've been working with nurses and doctors uh, for medical processes and medical systems because we build medical diagnostics equipment, molecular imaging equipment, and they absolutely love it. They have no problem at all with it. Um, uh, the other thing that we've done is we've um, gone and used it um, to do a validation by taking all the requirements and uh, connecting the requirements to pieces of the design, and then what we do is we run scripts to say, um, have all the requirements been covered by uh, by the de by the design? Um, the other thing that people like uh, seem to like is the fact that I can I can distinguish between regular requirements and regulatory requirements. So I can do this, and I'm using I'm using symbols that everyone understands. So when I go to the URML here and I specify that this is a um, Regulatory requirement um, type is biological probability. Where is it advanced? I don't know why I can't find it here. It might be an older version, but usually you can specify 
that something is right you can you can specify that it's regulatory in nature with that little that little symbol down in the lower left corner. Oh, I see why, because this isn't a requirement. It's a hazard. So I can drop uh, tools. So I can drop a requirement. I find it here. And I can I can put that little regulatory symbol on there and specify now that um, you have a regulatory requirement that um, impacts um, impacts this block. So you know the dependency. I can say. So this regulatory requirement impacts this block. Um, did, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, you did. Thanks, Brian. And so uh, people like it. They like it a lot more than using UML or SysML. At least people who are not computer people or are not uh, not engineer types who know the SysML. Um, so I find it much easier to work with stakeholders when I use this this nomenclature. Uh, the other thing, of course, is go and try to put variation points in traditional SysML. It's nearly impossible. Um, or to specify product features, cl product clusters, um, uh, you know, feature clusters, and, and so on, and specify, try to specify that, that you have two features and, and you have to pick the customer when they buy your product has to pick between one of them. Uh, trying to trying to just take that very simple concept and putting in traditional SysML is nearly impossible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is, is there anybody else um, who has any questions at all? Now, Brian, you offered, um, if, if people are interested, there's more information available. Well, if anybody's interested, you can have my plug in for free. Um, if you if you have Enterprise Architect and you're running either UML or SysML and you want to try it out, uh, it's free. Just ping me with an email, and I'll be more than happy to send it to you. Um, I'm not I'm not a tool vendor. My my job is I don't I don't I don't like to make tools. All I did was I made this because I needed it for my own use. But uh, you're free to uh, you're free to have the first incarnation, and maybe someone will take take pity on me and uh, provide some funding so I can either set it up for models for uh, Magic Draw or come out with the, the next version that's a little bit improved. So uh, there we are. Um. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Um, well, if nobody has any more questions for now. Um, if you think of anything afterwards, feel free to email um, Brian with with questions. And if you have any questions related to webinars in general, then email myself. Um, and this has been recorded, so it will be made available afterwards if you have colleagues who are interested in, um, in watching who weren't able to attend. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, Brian, for your time today. And thank you, um, everyone, for attending and, and putting up with yeah. me. So. <laughs> but thank you very much. I think um, I think everyone will have taken a lot away from it. They're not able to say anything at the moment, but... Uh, <laughs> Everyone's speechless. <laughs> I say thank you on behalf of everybody else. <laughs> okay, thank you all for attending. Okay, then. Well, thank you very much, and um, we hope to see you all at the next webinar, which will be in June, and I'll send out uh, information soon for that.